Does this mean I have to say nice things now? <laughs> Defense buffer. Good move. <laughs> hey, I have to show you this. Ooh, that was close. <laughs> Jeanette Spratt sent this in to me this morning. This is coconut cream pie. Did you want some? What's that? I'm willing to share this. Yeah, that would be torture to just hold this up and then not share it, wouldn't it? And I'm willing to torture you. But I'm, <laughs> I'm willing to share. It's, actually, say that I, I, uh, down here at the jail one time, I was I was holding some services, and so I went in. There were there were two services, and the very first service. Anybody here been incarcerated? I, I guess you don't want to talk about. It. So the first the first service, I went in and I ate a Big Mac in front of the inmates as slowly as I could. And when that service was over and the inmates were exiting, seriously, I got threats on my life. They said, if we weren't in here, we would kill you. I mean, they were a little ticked. And so the second service, I did another one. I ate another Big Mac in front of the inmates. It was wonderful. And they were a little ticked off as well. And I got some more threats on my life. But I had arranged for McDonald's to come in after the services and... I gave Big Macs to every inmate. And then I went around cell to cell. And I didn't get any more threats. <laughs> and they were my best friends. And they were really open to the gospel. Just because of a Big Mac. And so I came to lead you to the Lord with a co coconut cream <laughs> pie. <laughs> really, at, at break, we can eat this. Just all I'm asking is to save me one piece. Jeanette makes a great coconut cream pie. She she uses vanilla from Haiti. And you know, vanilla here in the States is... <laughs> but the real stuff... Oh. Excuse me. i got to cover this up. It'll distract me. It is great to be here. I was thinking, Cliff, while we were singing... I am very grateful today for peace. Is peace not a wonderful thing? I think it's one of those things that when we walk with the Lord, it's easy to begin to take for granted the blessings we receive. But what a wonderful thing to walk into his presence and be at peace. Not tied up in knots, not... Not thinking, oh man, I know I'm in a horrible state, but to know you're at peace with the king. What a great gift. Well, we are here talking about the immeasurably more. About moving from the confines of self into the expanse of God. Which, as we talked just briefly yesterday, the challenge that is because we live in a world that is defined by boundaries and parameters, and everything is contained. And everything we do has starts and stops. And so to, to move into this realm where we are literally unleashed can almost be intimidating, a little frightening. Seeing Dan here this morning brought back fright to me. When we were in Kenya, this is, I don't know, a couple hundred years ago, you don't know what preceded what you did. So we were, we were, we were in the Maasai Mara and he's taken us on the safari. But prior to that, we were in Nakuru and Isaac Sashiro. Do you all know Isaac? Great guy. And Isaac at that time was pastoring Lakeview over there in Nakuru. And, um, he took us down and it was, it was pouring down rain. I mean, just a torrential rain and we're going around the lake. And because the land, as it got wet, became like ice, it was real silty. And so the, the car, we're in this, I think it was a little Subaru, four-wheel drive, and we're just sort of like on ice sliding. 
and we turn this corner right into this herd of water buffalo. Well, what do I know? I, I know squat. Queenie and I are in the car, mind our own business, and we turn here the water buffalo, and this was Isaac's response. We turn, he goes, help us, Jesus, help us, Jesus, help us, Jesus. <laughs> and I thought, it would have been better if you just said that in Japanese, you know? Because <laughs> then I wouldn't have had a clue what's going on here. But now I know this isn't good. So when Dan takes us on this, we're, we're out in this Land Rover, and he, he decides, hey, there's a herd of water buffalo. Let's chase them. And I remember thinking, is that smart? And I thought, well, I'm no Dan. He's not smart. So what? We started chasing them, and they didn't care for it. They stopped on a dime and turned around. And that's when Dan said, we probably should go. Fear. It's a wonderful gift. There are fearful situations, but it's interesting that when it comes to the Lord, when he calls us to do things, sometimes even though we have a desire, it's fearful because it is, it's unknown. We're comfortable in defined spaces. We are uncomfortable and sometimes fearful in undefined spaces. Well, in this undefined space, we are called to be a disciple. It's a word we use all the time. And I, one of the questions I've been asking myself is, what does it take to make a disciple in the 21st century. Because uh, one of the things that I observe, at least in the local church, and so this is an indictment on myself as much as anybody, we're not seeing the kind of disciples come out of the church that I think the Lord wants. We're not seeing conversions that seem to bring transformation. It's almost as if the people are quite interested in a God that will clean up the mess, but not necessarily a God that will take their life and, and move them into that immeasurably more. Move them into something that is beyond their own small thinking. And all of us wrestle with small thinking. What is a disciple? Disciple simply is one who embraces and assists in spreading the teachings of another. Someone who is taught or who is learning. Um, it's a follower of a particular teacher. Someone who, who assimilates the thought processes and practices and habits of someone else. Now, here's, here's something that should be noted, and this perhaps is why we struggle with this concept. A disciple is always linked to someone else. A disciple never stands on their own. I mean, if you're a disciple, it means there's somebody you're following, and we are independent people. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a group of missionaries. I mean, you are like herding cats. ML said it yesterday, What well, you're all type A, you all want to do your own thing. You don't, I, I mean, you are perfect. God chose you well to send you out around the world in strange surroundings, and you're saying, I'm good with this. Bring it on! But a disciple is someone who is always dependent. Everything we do is linked to someone else. We never stand alone. I mean, I, I get... I, I told you the difference between Queenie and I. She's, she is not adventurous. I love adventure. I love to be dropped down in an environment where I don't speak the language. You just leave me alone and tell me, make your way. I think that's exciting. Queenie thinks that's insane. She's not a good disciple. That's not true. Do not quote me on that. Do not send the word back. <laughs> But see, that thinking on my part is nuts. Because we don't do anything alone. So in order to be a good disciple, I have to recognize from the outset, I will not be successful in this pursuit in life without Christ. That means everything I do has to be linked to Him, tied to Him. If I'm a disciple of His, if I'm really tied to Him, then I want to stay close to Him. And if I stay close to him, then I can't help but live in the immeasurably more. 
I live in the infinite, and the infinite lives in me. I am soaring high. Well, as we continue on in this passage study, it's interesting because we are hit with this paradox of the need to soar at the same time we have this need to be grounded. So how are we grounded and soaring at the same time? Well, the concept is certainly not new to you. I mean, you know it well, that you can't go high without going deep. You can't build a skyscraper hundreds of stories high unless you're going deep, deep, deep into the ground. So that's going to be our background, at least for this first session. Let's review. Let's review our passage. Ephesians 3, this wonderful prayer of Paul. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to just bring, but we're, we're, we're not going to be able to actually spend a lot of time with the tail end of that this week, but it's a fascinating thing, don't you think, that He says to Him be glory in the church before He says Christ? It's a fascinating thing that we serve a God who keeps putting us first what he does. Pray with me. Lord, as we as we continue to explore this concept of the immeasurably more, I feel most inadequate. All of us are challenged by our limits. And and when we begin to dwell and Focus on the fact that you have invited us in to your essence, your presence. It's quite humbling. It's also, Lord, humbling to think that your dreams are filled with us. I'm so grateful. So again, Lord, we pray that you would teach us. Embrace us with your spirit. Illuminate our minds. And may your name be praised in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, as we go into this, And he says, he prays that we would be rooted and established. Rooted. It has that, the sense of being stable. That if we're rooted, we've got these roots are going deep into the soil, the soil of Christ, and there is a stabilization that occurs. That even as, if we're the part above ground, as we're swaying and being rocked, we have roots that are holding us. We are stable. But he, he, he exceeds that. He says, I, I want you to be stable and rooted. And I want you to be grounded or established or settled. Being settled is an interesting thing. Some people are more easily settled than others. I talk to a lot of people who seem to be unsettled all the time. Fearful about this or wondering about that or... Or they're content here for a while and then we've got to change this and change that. And a sense of peace, a sense of being settled seems to be a tough thing for them to grasp. 
He says, I pray that you would be rooted and established. Okay, so here are disciples that need to be rooted and established. How do we get somebody to that point? I think one of the biggest mistakes that we've made, and and we probably, I think, would acknowledge it, at least intellectually, but though we acknowledge it, we still don't necessarily change our uh, systems. Disciples are not made in classrooms. They're not. Sunday schools do not make disciples. Seminars do not make disciples. How did Christ develop disciples? He says, let's live together. Now you're going to think I want to start a commune or something. (laughs) They did life together. Part of our challenge is that we become so busy we don't do life together. We meet. We'll meet in church or we'll meet in this meeting or we'll do this. But do we do life together? Making disciples doesn't happen in a classroom It occurs in a relationship. That's where it has to happen. And we struggle with that. We struggle with that level of vulnerability. He says, I pray that you would be rooted and established. Again, where do our minds go? We say, okay, I've got to be rooted and established. I've got to be in the Word. I'm going to be established in God's Word. I'm going to be rooted in the church. I'm going to be have my... my establishment in theological truth, in substance. And those are all great, all necessary. But he says, I pray that you would be rooted and grounded in what? Love. Love. Relationship. Now, First John tells us that what is love? God is love. So again, We can't escape. And you'll know in every part of this prayer, you cannot escape the immensity of God. He embodies every word. Every word embodies Him. He says, I want you to be rooted and established in love. Why? Because discipleship occurs in relationship. In relationship. I want want you to go, let's look at a passage in... uh, Proverbs chapter 2. He says, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Bob, go back one slide. Here's an interesting thing when we look at God's Word. There there are concepts on our minds that are accurate, but one of our challenges in reading the Word of God is to actually read what's before us and not read into it what we want it to say. It says here that we should apply our hearts to understanding. So we think... All right, I've got to, I've got to grasp as much understanding of truth as I can and stick it in here, right? But what does the passage say? Look at it again. Turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Uh, do y'all have breakfast again today? You know what my favorite breakfast is? Peanut butter toast. I love peanut butter toast. Anybody else here? Oh, I was scared for a minute that I was sitting amongst ungodly people. (laughs) Peanut butter toast. My kids laugh at me because um, I say that a home should never be out of peanut butter. And so I carry in our pantry six of the mega jars of peanut butter all the time. And by the way, there's only one peanut butter. It's Jif. If you eat something else, that's your issue. And we can probably have a healing service here at some point to help you. Creamy. Creamy. Yes. Oh. The sanctified section, if you're wondering. 
So you take, you, you stick the knife in and you take the peanut butter and you don't, don't get, Queenie used to fix me peanut butter toast and she'd toast it and then you'd look at it and you, is there peanut butter on there? I mean, it's, or did you just spray paint it in brown? I mean, what's the deal here? Peanut butter ought to be thick on that thing. I want, I want you to get the picture. I am taking the peanut butter and I am applying it to the bread. You get it? Look, let's look at it again in our scripture. Turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. It doesn't say apply understanding to your heart. So what does that mean? It's not that I want to take God and smear him over me. I want to be stretched out over him. You know what that means? Have you ever been in a position? We all, we've all done it. We've all said it. I feel like I'm stretched too thin. You know what I'm saying? Hey, if you're stretched out over God, you are never stretched too thin. There is not a shallow spot on the essence or person of God. He said, do you want to have substance? Do you want to have depth? Do you want to have that sustaining power that we were talking about? Apply your heart to understanding. Apply yourself to the essence of God. Now, that means that clearly we're going to be stretched. I meant to bring a rubber band with me and I didn't. But if I had a rubber band here and I pull it apart like this, what's taking place? This is not a lesson in physics or anything, but it's really simple. In order to stretch the rubber band, the properties of the rubber band have to yield to me. No yielding, no stretching. If I want to be stretched by the Lord, there has to, I have to live in a constant state of yieldedness. Anytime I refuse to yield, I will not be stretched. And that's where the thinness will begin to occur in my life. I'm, I'm, you know, whenever we go through something and we're, when we're in different spots, uh, it seems like the Lord wants to remind us of these truths. And so <clears throat> yesterday, yesterday afternoon, I was feeling the opposite of what I'm now telling you. I was feeling like I was stretched too thin. Uh, my aunt just died yesterday morning. My brother and I had the funeral on Friday. So um, I'm, I'm, I was trying to figure out my schedule because I've got to get to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for this funeral. And my flight was supposed to leave to go back to Kansas City tomorrow night. And so, um, and in addition to that, I, I had this a ton of work. Normally, um, I, I'm I am a way in advance planner, so I do two sermon retreats a year. And I I know this may sound bizarre to some of you, but and I wasn't always this way, but my sermons are always written usually eight to nine weeks in advance. What that means is, when emergencies occur, I'm okay. You know, you can mess me up and it tremendously lowers my stress level. I'm at a point that I'm not eight to nine weeks ahead. I'm, I'm one week out. That's it. This week. And then I'm toast. And uh, preaching anymore isn't the way it used to be because now, you know, it's not only writing the sermon, there's there's all the media that goes with it, and all the other things as we try to put on a show to capture people's attention, you know. So all these things are being put together, and uh, I thought I had this great plan that I would, this rental car, I mean, I said, well, I'll just extend that, I'll drive it out to Pittsburgh, fly home from there, call the rental car company, and they said, you can't take that car to Pittsburgh. You'll have to come down here. We'll give you another one you can take out there, but you're not going to take that one out and drop it. What's wrong with this? <laughs> That's a fancy car. Not can't. It's the rules here. So I got to drive to Indianapolis now to change cars and come back. And it's 
So yesterday I'm thinking about all this. I'm thinking, Lord, I only have so much time and this has to happen. And I was feeling the exact thing that I'm telling you. And I remember last night I'm sitting there. Thinking, and then God started to say, you know, Tom, there's a ton of people around you that could help you. Oh, yeah. So I started making calls for this, 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 this. That's why I reminded you earlier, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Disciples never function in a vacuum. And so often we assume so much responsibility, so much that we think we need to get done, that we eliminate other people from the process. Hey, if God wants to stretch you, he wants to stretch the people around you. He he wants to bring us all into this process. And he wants us to go deep in love. Well, we talked a bit yesterday, if you recall, that to go deep in love is highly risky. Anytime you engage in a relationship where you make yourself vulnerable, you're, you're liable to get hurt. And so our tendency is that we get into these relationships and we're arm's length. I'm amazed at the number of people, even in my profession as pastors, that remain distant from people. In fact, I remember uh, different people uh, would tell me about pastoring. They would say, now, when you become a pastor, you can never really have any friends. You should think, that's stupid. You're telling me I can't go into my church and have friends? Well, no, because... Somebody will be jealous if you have, if you're a friend to this person and they might not think you're as good a friend to that person. I remember thinking, if they think that, that's their issue, not mine. I can't live without friends. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna function at a distance from people. I mean, can you imagine God the Father speaking to God the Son? Don't get close to them. <laughs> They're gonna hurt you. Yeah, and we did. We did. And he still got close. And he keeps coming back for more. And then he says, be like me. How could he be anything less? So Paul prays that we would be rooted and established in love, in this relationship, in this highly risky, vulnerable relationship. Get in there, because this is what it means to mimic me. ML made such a great point yesterday about failure. And we all fail, do we not? I mean, I have far more failures to my record than successes. Far more. But see, this, this is the dynamic about love. Real love allows you to fail. And it doesn't push you away when you do. What, uh, as a kid growing up, I was fairly active. And, uh, to the point of sometimes driving my mom and dad nuts. And I remember we, we were going to visit my grandparents one day. We were living in Elizabeth, Pennsylvania at the time. They were washed in. So we all jumped in the car and dad had some mail that he wanted mailed. So we drove up to the end of the street. Ironically, we lived on Church Street. And the mailbox was on that side of the street. Dad pulls over to this side. And I'm in the back seat, just going blissing. Dad, Dad, let me mail it. Let me mail it. So we pull over, and Dad turns to me for the fatherly lecture. Now, Tom, when you get out of the car, be sure to go to the front of the car so I can see you. Look both directions. Give me all this. I'm looking like, Dad, do I look like I'm stupid? Just give me the mail. I'll take care of it. So I jumped out of the car. I went to the back of the car, not the front. I didn't look any direction, ran out in the street at about the same time that our neighbor was turning the corner, and we met. Cars have far more power than a little boy's body. And she, man, she hit me and threw me to the curb, and I was out. When that happened, my dad turned to my mom and said, what's the last thing I said to him? (laughs) 
You told him to look both ways. Go. That's right. My mom said, I say leave him. <laughs> and if he feels sorry when we come back, we'll take him home. Now you're laughing because you know that didn't happen. When that car hit me, simultaneous with that car hitting me, my mom and dad were out the door and running to me. When you sin and fall on your face, and you do, God does not call the angels in from the four corners of the earth and say, what's the last thing I said to him? He is bolting for your side. Because he died for you. You think he's going to let you out of his grasp that easily? He loves you intently. We have, we have, you know, Western Arminian theology, Reformed theology. And you, you want to be Reformed because you're eternally secure. You feel really good over there. I can do anything I want and I'm going to heaven. Meanwhile, we Western Arminians, we think if we just even look wrong in the mirror, we're going straight to hell. What kind of thinking is that? And I'll tell you, we've got a lot of people in Western Arminian theology that have buried themselves in do-nothingness because they're afraid to fail. They're afraid to blow it. I'm telling you, love gives you permission to fail because God is with you. He says you get rooted and grounded in love. Do you think in nearly 40 years of marriage that I've never hurt my wife? No. She's done a lot of things wrong. And I've had to respond. We're still married. Just because somebody does something stupid doesn't mean the marriage ends. Could the marriage end? Yes, it could. But just because something goes wrong, that what it says is we're going to reconcile because this relationship is built on love, not performance. My relationship with Christ is built on love, not performance. Now again... It doesn't mean that what we do doesn't matter. It does matter. But there's something significant that's behind it that gives me a security in pursuing what God wants me to pursue. You know what it means? When you're willing to fail, you have finally come to the point where you just might be able to make a contribution. Because if you're not willing to fail, you're not going to get anything done. It's in those failures that we pretty much learn what not to do. And by God's grace, we stumble on the right thing and we say, wow! But we also realize that when we do succeed, it's only by the grace of God. I think, sometimes I think God wants us to fail just to remind us that we need Him. It's it's kind of like, we have all experienced things that have left us hurting deeply. And we wish at times that those painful memories would go away. But I really think that sometimes God lets the pain remain just to remind us. Pain is one of our greatest protectors. I mean, how many here have ever burned yourself on a hot stove? Yeah, I have. So when I'm around a hot stove, I'm a little more careful because I remember how much it hurt. Pain is a great protector for us. So we shouldn't be so quick to see it go away. And people that come around me and will love me in spite of myself, I need them. Henry Nouwen is a great writer. This is what he says. He says, when we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us, we often find that it's those who, instead of giving advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. The friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can stay with us in an hour of grief and bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing, not curing, not healing, and face with us the reality of our powerlessness. That is a friend who cares. 
I think some of my richest moments with the Lord have been just being able to sit with him. And not necessarily hearing a word of direction, but just experiencing the presence of peace. And Tom, I'm with you. Just rest a minute. Take a deep breath. I'm going to keep walking with you. You don't need direction right now. You just need to catch your breath. Wow. And and you're going to stay here? I don't have to be doing something 24-7. I don't have to perform in front of you to have you stick around. I'm with you. With that, he continues on. He He says, I pray that you would have the power together with all the saints. So what he's telling me is, that whatever it is he has for me isn't just for me. Other people have already got it. So it's not unattainable. What I can have live in me, who I can have live in me, the power that can flow through me, others have already grasped it, nailed it, that sense of seizing it and holding on. Which, by the way, anytime I grasp something to hold it, The mere fact of grasping it speaks, again, of dependence. When I grab a hold of a rail going down steps, I become dependent. When I step into an elevator, I become dependent. When I sit on the chair, I become dependent. Do you understand that? So again, built into this is not only the immensity of the character and the person of God but all the way through the necessity of dependence. I want you in, and I want in. But I'll tell you what, it's only going to happen with me, my power. We are not alone. The love of God can be attained, and our rooting and grounding gives us the ability to grasp the love of God. There's a depth to the love of God. What time is it? When does this session end? It really doesn't matter, does it? Because it ends when, I'm, when I finish. <laughs> this session might go a little longer, so we'll make the next one shorter. Theoretically. <laughs> See, I heard ML say yesterday, I'll never go over, and I'll always let you out early. And he lied right off the bat. <laughs> right off the bat. Did you notice that? Oh, see, he's rationalized it out. I didn't give you a break. I gave you coconut cream pie. He says, I pray that you would have the power to grasp that you would be, may have, uh, actually in the Greek says that you're able to. You have the ability to. That, That what I'm asking is not some unattainable thing that you can seize it and grasp it. Now, because he involves these other people, he's also bringing out a fundamental reality that I want us to get a hold of here. In in the last, um, I'm going to say 20 years, maybe 25 years of my ministry, I, I am a pastor. I love being a pastor. I, I have to tell you, I probably love pastoring today more than I ever have in my whole life. I, I just, I love it. I love people. I love the Lord. I'm so grateful that God lets me do this. And people give me a paycheck. I do what I love to do, and people give me a paycheck for it. I do not feel guilty about that at all. <laughs> but... um where I, I used to identify myself as a shepherd... The last 25 years, this has been being inculcated in me that I need to view myself as a leader. You're a leader first. And I get all that. I mean, I'm not negating the importance of that. But you understand that my primary role is a follower. That's what a disciple is. 
A disciple is a follower. And if I am unable to follow the way I should, I can't lead anybody. Because if I'm leading in any capacity, that means somebody's following me, and if I'm not following the Lord, wherever I lead you is not going to be good. And I always, you know, when, when if somebody comes and says, boy, I really like what's happening at your church, and I always say, hey, as long as it's going well, you know God's control. If it goes south, I took over. You can just pretty much know that. We are followers. You are followers. You should not be ashamed of that label. You should be grateful for such a label, that we have someone worth following. And so we we follow the king. And he says, I pray that you would know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. I, I have a fear of heights. So, uh, but somehow being in a plane is different. I, probably because there's boundaries. I, I'm not going to fall out. But what's interesting is when you're in a plane, you're up that high. When you're when you're not thirty thousand feet, but when you're down low enough, you can see the ground. It's pretty fascinating because all the lots are kind of squared out. You see, I mean, everything is so much clearer from a higher position. I think one of the reasons that he says talks about the height of God is that he gives us a different perspective. He wants us to see life and people, humanity, everything from his vantage point. And and when he does, he, he raises us up with a sense of dignity. How long? I think this speaks somewhat of the perseverance of God and our ability to persevere. How wide Boy, when you're driving down the road and, and uh, somebody has something that drops out of the back of a pickup or you see some dead animal and you, you're swerving to get out of the way, the sense of the passage is there's no swerving around the person of God. He's wide. Can't get around him. You can crash into him. You can deny that he's there, but you can't get around him. You gotta hit, you gotta face him in one way or another. How deep the, the profoundness of the person of God. How he, how he works and how he designs. Um, I'm gonna take you back to 1932. Somewhere around Washington, D.C. And, uh, there was apparently some stuff going on, hospital, it shouldn't have been going on. And a child was born out of wedlock. And the child was actually passed off in a back alley to a family to raise. The surgeon, the doctor who passed that baby off, um, Colonel Norman Wiley, he was the guy who who kicked Patton out of that field hospital, if you're familiar with what occurred in the Second World War, when Patton was trying to send a soldier back into battle who was still in the hospital, and uh, the surgeon stepped in and said, get out. Anyway, that was the guy who passed this baby off. <coughs> the baby was raised then in a Christian home and ultimately gave herself to the Lord. It made a difference. I, I know this because that lady's my mother. I think, what if she had been aborted? I wouldn't be here. Certainly not as me. But God in his grand design had this hand on her life. It's incredible to me. I marvel at that. My my dad's dad, that was not always a believer, and um, when he gave his life to the Lord, when my dad was a teenager, his passion for the Lord was deep. My my grandfather was crippled. He was he was bent over in this position. 
paralyzed with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So he was frozen, his neck was frozen, and it was difficult for him to get around. And Dad and his brothers were up in the upper part, the upstairs of their home, and my grandfather would climb the steps at night to get to him to pray with him, which for him was about a two-hour two ordeal. But my dad came to Christ. And then he met my mom. These two unlikely stories coming together. And God in his grand design. Hey, I want to know how long and high and wide and deep is a God who can make that happen. I want to live in his essence. I want to be caught up in his fullness. I, I want to live in that kind of immeasurability. What are the odds of something like that happening? I'm saying immeasurable. This Sunday, I'm, I'm actually preaching, I'm, I'm in this a series called The Lights of Christmas. And last week we dealt with how God reveals himself with what we call, I call skylights, just looking into the heavens and how God has revealed himself in the context of all that. This week we're going to deal with streetlights and 322 prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to the coming of Christ. But one thing that comes to my mind, um, 322 prophecies coming to Christ, all of which have been fulfilled. The odds of only eight of those being fulfilled would be 1 in 10 to the 17th power. The odds of only 8 of them being fulfilled. What are the odds? This is bizarre. What are the odds that a God as immense as our God says that you and I are worth it? In spite of all the stuff you've done, and you know what you've done, in spite of all the stuff I've done, I tell you what, if any of us walked in here today and thought at any point that we could go and pull the shades up on your brain and all of us could see everything you've ever done or thought and it would be exposed for everybody here, this room would be empty. What are the odds that God says, I love you. Come live with me. The immeasurability of God. Lord, you are so rich. You are so embracing. And we are so grateful. Continue to stir these things up in our hearts as we give you the praise in Christ's name.